Hello everyone and namaste to you. This is going to be our last session before the summer break. We will restart our sessions on the 28th of July and we will be taking up the new text, the Tantric text, Tripura Rahasya. This session is the last session of the Yoga Sutras. In our last session, we talked about Kevalya and basically the understanding was that once we are able to make a distinction between buddhi and pure consciousness, the mind starts moving towards liberation. When this separation takes place, it becomes very clear that buddhi Though is very, very sattvic, it's the most sattvic aspect of the mind, it is not Atman or Purusha, it is not pure consciousness. It is still a part of the mind. As the mind starts moving towards liberation, still all the same, what can happen is that there may be some setbacks. So verse 27 of the last chapter says Through breaks in seeing discriminative knowledge arise other fluctuations of the mind due to the force of residual samskaras. Discriminative knowledge is when the witness then sees through the cloudy mind. It sees that the mind itself is an object. It's no longer lost in that cloudy mind. It has now separated and is very clearly seeing the cloudy mind and the fluctuations. But there may be breaks in this discriminative knowledge. That means there may be times when again the witness and the mind are once again in this alliance. And that distinction is not clear anymore. And why is this? It's because the samskaras have got active again. This force of residual samskaras is still is there. It's, it's, the residue is there, and as long as those remaining samskaras have not been burned finally in the fire of knowledge, they can get active. So as long as there are samskaras, there is chance of a setback. There will be breaks in discriminative knowledge. We can have a look at our diagram and try to understand this a little bit better with the diagram. When there's discriminative knowledge, there's, while there's no total break, I'm just using this as a, a way to explain this, the center of consciousness is disconnected from the mind in a sense and is able to view the entire mind, body and the world like a witness. And so the mind itself now becomes an object that the witness witnesses. Now, when that happens, these samskaras which are here, they start attenuating. 
But as long as there are some samskaras, as long as there are samskaras, there is a possibility of a setback, which means that, again, that connection, which sort of had broken, suddenly re-establish itself. Because these samskaras in the active and latent unconscious mind were active. So what does this mean for us? Even though you may not have experienced this level of discriminative knowledge, even though you may feel that uh, you may have insights, but you have not experienced the state of the witness. You have not experienced Sakshi Bhav. As long as that has not happened, you may have difficulties understanding this, but having had that experience one time, that of a witness, does not mean you can sit back and relax. It means that this is in fact an opportunity and the very first steps towards the real journey. So you can say that the real journey begins with one of these glimpses and then the real work starts off beginning to clear the active and the latent unconscious mind by attenuating the kleshas and by burning up finally the entire latent and active unconscious mind in the fire of knowledge. What does it mean, fire of knowledge? There is no real fire, of course. Fire of knowledge means the light of awareness. Parambaragya. It's called a fire because it seems to burn up these little seeds and they're roasted. When seeds are roasted, they lose their power to germinate. So they are roasted in the light of knowledge. And so metaphorically one speaks of the fire of knowledge. Also, in the experience itself, some people, it comes generating a lot of tapas, heat, and not necessarily physical heat, but going through a very, very difficult process of purification. Because to look at one's own glaciers is not easy. Any comments, thoughts, or questions about verse 27? Setbacks. Verse 28, the removal of the fluctuations is similar to the process of removal of glaciers, which has already been described in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. So this purification of these residual samskaras must happen. So to remove the vrittis, the fluctuations of the mind, this movement of the mind, you need to purify these residual samskaras. And how do you do that? You use the same method as described earlier. You need to attenuate. You need to look at these glaciers that become active or those that are latent or interrupted, even attenuated. Burn them up in the fire of knowledge or light of awareness. And until this purification is completed, there's always a chance of a setback. So right to that last, down to the last samskara, so to say, there is a chance of setback. So don't, so to say, don't rest on your laurels. Keep, keep working. Keep expanding your consciousness. Keep getting greater awareness so that you don't fall. What can happen when 
on falls, in these setbacks, is that once again, samskaras that may have been eliminated or attenuated get stronger. Anger, arrogance, pride, greed, all these can become active again, can even be strengthened again. If the awareness is not sharp, if the circumstances are such. And for the yogi who has already experienced discriminative knowledge, this is a very painful thing. Remember, then he has become very sensitive. His mind is like the eyeball, very sensitive. So for a yogi of that order, this is this is a terrible and painful experience. And what happens when all the samskaras are not banned? A yogi has experienced some discriminative knowledge, has experienced the state of the witness, has not succeeded in burning all the seeds of desire. And he dies. What happens then? Well, it's not too bad because it's a bit like in accounts. It's carried over to the next year. You know, the accounts are carried over. Profit and loss is carried over to the next year. Similarly, here too, all that you have gained, merit, demerit, is carried over to the next life. Similarly, if you have evolved and you have grown, you will have a privileged birth. So it's not as if it's terribly sad, but it would be definitely um, for a yogi of that order not um, a satisfactory end. And such a person who has experienced discriminative knowledge in the state of witness, if he should die in the state of witness, he is a jivan mukt. This means that the remaining samskaras can be burnt out and worked out and burnt up in the disembodied state. So he does not have to take a body again, but can work out his samskaras in a disembodied state. So we come to verse 29. Perpetual enlightenment is this group, two verses here. When one is detached even towards eternal knowledge, One attains a perpetual discriminative enlightenment called Vivekyati. And when it is perpetual, when it is all the time, it's called Dharma Megha Samadhi. So now the person who is a witness is completely detached. He's so detached, even he's detached towards eternal knowledge. And this there are, there are no more breaks. You saw in the earlier group it said breaks and setbacks. So there are no more breaks in discriminative enlightenment. And this awareness as a witness is continuous and unbroken. Such a state is called Dharma Megha Samadhi. Dharma means your true nature or the self or awareness. And Megha is rain. It is the rain of awareness or the rain of Dharma, true nature, or rain of pure consciousness. Different ways of putting it give you an idea what it means. It is like a shower, it's called rain 
Why is it called rain? It's like a shower. It showers down. And this is probably the origin of certain rituals which are there throughout all traditions in the world. The tradition of ritual bathing, the tradition of, in Christianity, baptism, the tradition uh, in India of Abhishek, of showering the deity with milk or water. It's, it's like a pranic shower and that's experienced like in this form of rain and it is pouring down now it's all the time and then it's experienced briefly of course it's short-lived but when it becomes perpetual discriminative enlightenment it's really like a heavy shower Once you have had this, then verse 30 says, then follows freedom from kleshas and karma. This means now you are free. Who's free? Let's have a look at our diagram. All these kleshas have been burnt up here. Everything burnt up. What is left? There's, this is fully expanded and that's how you burn it up. It's fully conscious. And when that happens, this is full consciousness here. Then you experienced center of consciousness as universal consciousness. So everything becomes conscious and there is no, there are no more kleshas. There is no more, uh, no more samskaras. If there are no more kleshas, then you're free of the bondage of karma. It means, doesn't mean that you, you stop work. Maybe you don't, maybe you do. But what it does mean is that you're no longer bound by that work. There are no expectations, there are no expectations of reward. The work is in a completely different manner, has a different quality. And... It has no binding power. Such a person then generally works to serve others. So all the samskaras have been destroyed by the light of awareness. Everything is conscious. Every... And when that has happened, there is no setbacks. There are no downfalls. This is complete liberation. Any questions or thoughts about this? Jaren says, how can we reach there? Well, <laughs> that was what the entire Yoga Sutra was about. You can re-listen to the earlier lectures. They're on the channel. And it goes through the entire process. However, there is, of course, a difference between reading, listening, and understanding the Yoga Sutras and the actual practice of it. For those of you who are part of our tradition, who are training with me, of course, we do these meditative practices. It's a very systematic approach, and you will go through that training. If you do not have a teacher or a tradition, and you are doing it yourself, then, of course, it may uh, differ and... Um, if you are so privileged um, and have had a privileged birth, then you will attain something. So, as I said, it's a matter of practice, ultimately, and it requires a certain amount of patience as well, John. 
so we will you will continue i hope to do your practice as you're being guided by myself we have many many stages that we have to go through and um, i do not wish to uh, give false hopes but one has to be patient already with simple practices one sees a lot of benefit so as we saw in verse 30 that all these kleshas are uprooted you know the kleshas were like little seeds and out of that were growing all these actions and suffering and pain and now when the kleshas have been uprooted there is no more rebirth you know free from the bondage of karma all the samskaras have been destroyed so what happens next well the yoga sutras say verse 31 then as a result of removal of the veils of impurities knowledge is infinite in comparison the knowables appear as few now all the impurities have been removed all those glaciers have been removed and we saw in a diagram that now everything was conscious so what has happened knowledge or consciousness is infinite as i said it becomes universal consciousness so that individual consciousness seems to sort of expand it's an expansive quality and becomes universal consciousness in reality there was never any difference because the drop of water is the same as the ocean a drop of water from this, this, the ocean is the same as the ocean has the same qualities so similarly individual consciousness is the same as universal consciousness there's no difference only individual consciousness is limited by the body and mind and once the limitation has been removed and the complete mind has become conscious then that your consciousness expands and is one with the universal consciousness this means it is infinite what does that mean the knowables appear few well there is nothing left really to know after that now we are not referring to specific information but we are referring here to wisdom or understanding deeper understanding so it doesn't mean that one who has attained this level of infinite knowledge can answer you some questions from some quiz it's not about information when we talk about knowledge here we are talking about deeper intuitive knowledge for example let's take gold when you know gold you know the jewelry made out of gold you know what is the quality of the earrings what is the quality of the necklace because it's all gold you know it so similarly when you know pure consciousness itself then you know everything because everything is made out of pure consciousness it is basically saying the same thing that is said in the vedas vedanta philosophy knowing that all is known so there's nothing really much left to know so there's a huge shift in consciousness it's no longer acquiring knowledge in a sequential analytical manner most of the times we when we try to acquire knowledge whether it's through books or or any other form or medium we trying to acquire this knowledge at an intellectual level this is not knowledge at an intellectual level this is very deep intuitive knowledge 
And it's a complete shift in consciousness. It's a quantum leap. We cannot understand it's the mind or this kind of person to say the mind is, is not correct because um, in a sense, the mind doesn't exist in the way we know it. Such a person has no handle in certain areas. To give you an example, all of us, most of us know what chocolate is and like it. You have a desire for it. So that means there is somewhere there's a chocolate samskara. Let's take um, somewhere in the world, maybe in the rainforest of Amazon or, or Indonesia, perhaps there's an uncontacted tribe that has not tasted chocolate, doesn't know about chocolate. They don't have a samskara about chocolate. So if you go to them and show them a chocolate, they're not going to say, oh, wow, I want to have the chocolate because they don't know what this funny looking brown bar is. They have no connection to that. There is nothing there in terms of klesha. And so now imagine that you meet a person who actually has no kleshas like the kleshas you have. It's very difficult to relate to such a person. This is what happens when we meet people from very different countries that you may not have been to or you know nothing about. You find it difficult to relate to the person. And the reason is that you don't have these glaciers, which are common. So the removal of these impurities or glaciers expands the consciousness to universal consciousness. This is such a huge shift in consciousness that we cannot imagine or relate to such a person. So we are coming to the last block, the very last uh, verses of the Yoga Sutras. So once again, I'd like to say uh, make a small announcement. I just want to repeat for those of you who've joined in later that this is our last meeting for before the summer break. This is also the last meeting of the Yoga Sutras. With this block, we enter the Yoga Sutras. We will restart our meetings on July 28th and we will be taking up the fabulous Tantric text, Tripura Rahasya. Any questions so far? <clears throat> hello, Radhika ji. This is Kumuda. Yes. Hello. Namaste. Namaste. I just wanted to check. Um, so do we have any prerequisites for the next meeting that you just mentioned? Prerequisites? Um, no, there are no prerequisites. The text is always here. And are you in our Facebook group? Yes, I am. Yeah. I posted the uh, link for the Tripura Rasya. If you're interested, you can purchase that book. It's a very fascinating book and, uh, you know, you can read it. It's very nice to read. We will be discussing that uh, in detail. It's a fascinating text. It's a very interesting text because it's one of the few where there are many women teachers. Um, very beautiful, um, interesting stories which are very symbolic. And a uh, very empowering text for everybody. Some people find that it's not necessarily suitable for householders, but I don't agree with that. I find that especially because the text refers to stories in which there are women teachers. I find that also very empowering for women. So no prerequisites. You can join in. So uh, when I say prerequisites should be should we be at a level of sadhana in this process or um, no even anybody who's starting to know or just yes, um, yes. The... anyone can join okay. and the reason is that these texts and the way we um, conducting these uh, sessions is that i try to simplify things keep the language easy keeping in mind you may not understand every single thing but you can always ask and okay. Still, all the same, 
there are certain things which I'd say we have to practice, gain experience and understand that over a period of time. You know, it's like a spiral. It's an upward moving spiral. So it goes okay. round and round. You know, you come back to the same things again and again. And every time you read something again or you encounter it again, you will, mm -hmm. that knowledge will go deeper. You will have deeper insights about it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so verse 32. Having fulfilled their purpose, the process of change in the gunas ceases. So we talked about gunas and we said gunas are basically rajas, tamas, sattva. These are like, um, it's, it's a bit like uh, the foundation of this philosophy and it's a bit like atoms, protons and neutrons. It's like the whole world is made of consciousness and then this consciousness is, is sort of qualified in these three forms. But the moment it is qualified, it is no longer pure consciousness. It is now already at the level of the mind. So it's at the level of the mind, sometimes you're tamasic, that means you're dull, feeling a little bit down, low, heavy. Sometimes you're rajasic, the mind is active, dynamic, full of ideas, creative. Sometimes the mind is sattvic, that means it's sometimes very calm, tranquil, it's undisturbed, very intuitive, and very, has a lot of trust. So this process of changing from sattva, rajas, tamas, the continuous movement ceases. It ceases because it has fulfilled its purpose. What was the purpose? The purpose was that you experience something, bhoga, and to that you desire liberation. And when you have been liberated, the guna sees for the yogi, that is for, for the person who is who's a meditator. The gunas don't cease for the others. The others will continue to go through their experiences of pain and suffering. And they will continue to go through that until the desire arises to overcome this suffering, to get out of that. And that desire is lit. It gets stronger and stronger until it becomes a fire. It becomes a fire of knowledge and it burns up these samskaras, these glaciers which are causing the limitation, which is causing the suffering. And when that's all gone, your pure consciousness, you have, you look upon everything as equal. There is no longer much change for you because you are established now in pure consciousness. So that process of change, which is called Kram, Krama ceases. And this is where most of us want to go. You want to get out of this continuous change which is causing all these experiences of suffering and pain. That is why most of you are interested in this matter. Even though the Yoga Sutras are sometimes difficult to grasp, this is why those few people who have been searching, they stumble upon these teachings, or they are drawn to these teachings because they are seeking a way out of suffering. So the pen penultimate verse, verse 33. The sequence of moments, shana, shana is a moment, just this moment is a shun. So the sequence of moments which become entirely apprehensible at the end of the change in gunas is krama. So what is krama? Krama is when there's a process of change. It's a sequence of movements. So what are they talking about here? Actually, they're talking about time. 
This is how we are conditioned by time. It's like these impressions around us, they're all momentary, but all these moments together make this experience. So it's a chain of events or a chain of movements. It's like movies. When you see a film, whether you see it on television or whether you see it on, on, the, on the big screen, there are a whole lot of images called frames. And these frames are telecast or projected on the screen at a certain speed. When the speed is between 24 to 30 frames, I think, some, somewhere there, uh, per second, the eye actually creates this sense of motion in it. In reality, it's just a whole number of separate images which have been projected. But because they have been projected so fast, there's an illusion of movement. This is happening because there's, in the eye, there is something, it's called persistence of vision. So the, the eye holds that for a split, split moment, that image in the mind. And if the next one follows immediately, and the next and the next, it creates a sense of motion, right? So that's how these moving pictures started. This whole technology turned into movies and television, all that we know today. It's based on the same principle of time. There are all these impressions around us. One by one, these moments come together and create the world. But that all ceases when you live in the present. So this is the concept of time. It's been explained here. The very last verse says, So when the gunas are without any objective to fulfill, they recede. Purusha abides in his true nature. Yavalya, the state of absolute or universal consciousness, is established. So once again it says, now the gunas, they cease to exist in a way because they, they are resolved. They have no more objective to fulfill. The objective was liberation. Remember, it serves two purposes. This world around us serves two purposes. One is experience or bhoga. And two is liberation. So the pain and suffering of experience leads us to our search for liberation. And when these objectives have been fulfilled, you don't want to experience suffering and pain. You have worked towards liberation and you have been liberated. Gunas recede and Purusha shines forth. You abide in pure consciousness. This Kaivalya or universal consciousness is established. The word they have used is Chitta Shakti. Remember, Shakti is a tantric word. Very often people have said, Yoga Sutras, there is no Tantra in the Yoga Sutras. It's purely Sankhya. But the fact is that the very last word of the Yoga Sutras is a tantric word, Shakti. Shakti is pure consciousness in the universal form. Shakti is the, the feminine energy, the divine mother. We see the world around us as the mother and individual consciousness is the father. And once we have surrendered and are in the lap of the Divine Mother or Chitta Shakti. The Gunas have no objective to fulfill, they recede and there is no more suffering. That is Kaivalya, total liberation. And from there, there is no more fall, no more setbacks, no more breaks in knowledge. Total freedom. So 
So I think that was nice to contemplate on this for a few seconds. Total freedom. It's been, uh, I think, almost uh, six months or so that we have been going through the Yoga Sutras, yes. And uh, it's been a very interesting sessions with all of you. There have been some very good questions and some nice discussions, very good feedback from everybody. I hope that it was useful. We did this version of the Yoga Sutras verse by verse, as opposed to one of the earlier sessions, which was the Essential Yoga Sutras. And that was done in a slight, there was a slightly different presentation, but it's also on the channel available. Are there any questions regarding Yoga Sutras, regarding practice, regarding general questions? Radhika. Yes. Radhika Ji. Yes, Manisha. Hi, Manisha. Yeah. I have a question about yeah. Shakti. Mm -hmm. Would you, and I don't know if you would consider this to be related to Yoga Sutra, but I was just wondering um, in the way that Shakti is used for those of us who may use this term in everyday language. And then also in terms of how the term has been adopted in, let's say, I guess, a more popular yoga culture. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that connection uh, between the definition you gave it and what, um, I guess I will say, the word power? Mm -hmm. And if you could just expand on that. And I'm going to put myself back on mute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank in you. colloquial language in India, Shakti is used as power. It also means physical power, energy. It can mean Shakti in different forms. Uh, this is, of course, colloquial language. When we speak of the word Shakti, we are referring, of course, to a more technical term. And it is used uh, in Tantric literature. It's used sometimes also in, I would say, modern, popular, as you call it, popular, um, culture is sort of thrown around <laughs> a little bit um, to to mean different things, you know, feminine energy, female power, and and I think to that ex to some extent, when it is used in this way in popular culture, it is it is uh, misunderstood and um, in tantric literature. Shakti has a very deep meaning, very divine meaning. It is really universal consciousness. And we, we see that in the deities as well. There's Shiva and Parvati. Now Shiva, Shiva Shakti is, is, is Parvati or Uma. She's got different names. And sometimes she's just called Shakti. So in Tantric literature, this is common. Shiva is individual consciousness and Shakti is universal consciousness. What this means is that as individual consciousness is within you, it is limited by the mind and body, but universal consciousness is everything around. The entire world is a form of Shakti. And we see this world generally as very threatening and we experience a lot of pain and suffering. And this leads us to the search for liberation. But when we have acquired this state of the witness, this world is no longer painful, it's no longer a battlefield. It becomes a playground. It's beautiful. It loses its frightening quality. It becomes loving. It becomes wonderful. And that's why then the Divine Mother is also very 
unconditional in her love. She's full of abundance, prosperity. And so one who has attained or even is moving towards liberation comes to terms with the world around, which is all a form of universal consciousness, and begins to see it as a place to live out desires, to grow, to learn, to, to expand his or her consciousness. So it becomes a wonderful playground. And so in this sense, Chitta Shakti, universal consciousness, acquires a very, very different meaning from that in popular um, culture, popular yoga culture, as well as uh, in colloquial languages. Totally different. So I hope that was uh, useful, Manisha. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, from Jayan, I have a question. Even Adi Shankara forgets to get back to the ashram after enjoying the householder life. How is that moksha gives liberation? Well, that's just... Um, um, that, that is, of course, a legend. It's a story that... Uh, you talked about, yes, when we talked about the setbacks here, yeah, the breaks and setbacks. Now, until total liberation, there can always be setbacks. Now, of course, the legend you're talking about, I, I cannot <laughs> tell you about the state of uh, Adi Shankara's, uh, you know, um, sadhana at that time but if it is true and he lost himself in the life of the householder at that time that was a break or setback important thing is that you remember it doesn't matter how many times you fall that's more important how many times you remember you awaken there are many little awakenings that we have all of us have also little awakenings Every now and then we suddenly get reminded the universe around us, the world around us reminds us, pain and suffering reminds us. We always get these reminders and we wake up and we say, oh, let me not waste my time. Let me do sadhana. Let me expand my consciousness. And that's the important part. So, Yes, when you go into the world and you enjoy the life of the householder, there's always a chance of setbacks and breaks. But you can see these also as an opportunity to live out samskara's desires. And Adi Shankara had to live that out, apparently. So... Once also you have tasted a little bit of this discriminative knowledge, then you will see that it's not that you want to go back to the life of a householder, but you realize that there are certain things that have to be lived out. You saw the samskaras there in the active and latent unconscious. You only have two choices. Either you burn them up in the fire of knowledge or you manifest them live them out in, in life. Sometimes it's actually easier to live out certain samskaras than it is to burn them up in the knowledge you know, of the meditative fire of awareness. Any further questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then we can end our session here, our very last session. And to all of you who are also taking summer break, I wish you a very 
nice summer vacation to the others. We will see you on 28th July. Thank you, Perry. And yes, um, it'll be nice to see you in July. Same to you, John. Namaste, goodbye. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Hmm. Goodbye, Sumit, Suri, Debbie, Manisha. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, Kumada. <laughs>